So um, um, this is an expert session, and so um, we have three speakers today. So uh, I'm David Canada from Integral Group. Um, I'm a, an electrical engineer that does building design, a lot of focus on uh, net zero energy buildings. Um, to my left is Paul Torsellini with National Renewable Energy Labs. He's one of the leading thinkers in the country on uh, zero energy and, and some of the issues that are going on with grids and things like that. We were uh, planning to have Peter Turnbull from PG&E, but unfortunately, um, he was un unable to join us. So um, we have a uh, Ted Tiffany from Goodman and Blavowit here. Um, to help explain some of the utility companies um, um, thinking on, on some of these issues related to, to grids and, and the duck curve. Um, Ted's, uh, in addition to being an outstanding mechanical engineer, um, he's also on the, um, uh, the MBI grid optimal uh, group and uh, also on the part of the building decarbonization coalition. So, um, um, all of us are, are, are trying to have been talking about this issue with the duck curve and net zero energy buildings and how, how um, the grid and buildings interface with each other. Hopefully, I, I know there's a lot of experts in the audience. I'm looking at a bunch of them. Um, and so we're looking forward to presenting a couple slides, but then trying to have a really lively discussion with the experts in the room about what are the issues and what can we do about them? Um, so these are our four learning objectives and the way we've organized this presentation is we're gonna just hit each of these four topics um, as maybe 10, 10 minute discussion points um, and then take questions and then go to the next point. So the first one is um, um, our goal of minimizing the impact of buildings um, on the environment. Uh, so um, these are some of the key topic areas, but let's just get into the slides. So um, you want to start with this one, Paul? Sure. Did we have the first call still? Yeah. Okay. No, we did that already. Oh. So no, this one. Yes. Okay. Did that. okay. All right. So, you know, as we think about buildings, we're going to have a kind of a dialogue here. And again, thanks for coming uh, between all of us. So we're going to kind of in interject comments as we go through a couple of slides to intro. And then we really want to open it up to you for your questions, your discussion uh, about this, realizing a lot of folks out there. And how do we address what's coming down the line? And so looking historically, you know, we've all been pushing for a long time on energy efficiency and made great strides with that. And you know, we kind of always thought about, well, what if you know, we get these buildings that are really efficient and we can add renewables to the grid and so we can really reduce the environmental impact of those buildings? Well, that day is here. And we're starting to see a lot of other issues and things come up that we need to be prepared to address and as a group address in the next 10 to 20 years in order, order to further get down this track of minimizing the environmental impact of buildings. Some of that has to do with the decarbonization of the grid. You know, and interesting things happening when we start adding solar and wind. How is the grid responding to that? How are we dealing with price structures related to that? Uh, we'll talk in a minute about the duck curve and ramp rates, but also looking at storage and electrification as part of that. So David, next slide. David's controlling the slides today. Um, and so when we look at you know, zero energy buildings, that concept, you can think of a highly efficient building, but then, especially if that is a renewable photovoltaic piece, you know, it happens during a very short period of the day. And what's happening is even on this individual building, you know, you get this point where somebody's got to take this energy during the day. And if everybody starts doing this, what happens? Well, the cost of renewables has come down dramatically, and we're seeing much more of that happening, to the point that we get the infamous duck curve, which was kind of where we started. And really, the discussion is, you know, we I need drew that duck. <laughs> Very nice, David. 
Um, really, the discussion is, you know, how do we get rid of the duck, right? And how do we look at the different pieces of it? Now, a couple of things on this. Things are changing very, very quickly. And I think that's part of the dialogue today is how quickly things are changing. You look at 2012 at the top, and there really wasn't much. And as we've added more efficient buildings, photovoltaics on those buildings, large photovoltaic farms, we're starting to see projections where we've got that belly in the center. And from the utilities point of view, this rapid increase late in the day. That rapid increase costs money, right? And the first person that pays that money is the utility because they have to be prepared to meet that ramp rate. And ultimately, then what happens? The customer has to pay that. And so a lot of the discussion we should be thinking about is how do we make buildings good grid citizens to deal with this change that's going on? Because ultimately, if we can do that, we can put more renewables on the grid. You want to talk about this one? Or do you want me to continue? So, so one of the things that, um, um, from a utility standpoint, is that um, the grid's rapidly decarbonizing. So if you look at, at, at this graph, there. oops, sorry, <coughs> forgot. If you look at this graph, you could see that uh, the carbon in the power that's being delivered is dropping way off. Um, the other issue is that you can only take the power down so far. There's, there's different types of, this is a graph of different sources of energy for the Western United States. So you can see, for example, at the bottom is, is nuclear, right? And so you can't just turn that off. Um, and so different sources of energy uh, cannot easily be ramped up and ramped down. And so one of the things that we're having seeing is that as that duck curve kicks in and, and that the belly of that duck drops down, you can't just take it all the way down to zero because of the um, different sources of energy that you can't turn off. What's interesting on this curve to me too is when you look at the amount of PV that's going on this particular grid, it's a pretty significant amount. And again, it's a very short part of the day, right? Mm -hmm. And the way that the utility grouping or the ISO is managing that is they're actually ramping up and down the coal, which also has some efficiency impacts to it, which ultimately means that the coal has a larger per kW impact. But the other part of it is, is that the utilities now are in this mode of starting to curtail, in particular, the PV because they can't cut into these fossil fuel generators anymore, and they certainly can't cut into that nuclear generation. Um, now, looking at this, one of those solutions would be is, how do we get buildings to use more energy during those periods of the time when we're curtailing, and less energy late in the afternoon to help with that ramp rate? So those dotted lines right there are the times when we're curtailing. And um, if you look close, the yellow is the solar energy. And so all the curtailing is happening in the middle of the day when PV is maximized. And David, I think one thing to really highlight here is this is a seasonal issue right now, but it's really predictive of what will happen more times of the year. Um, this is a particularly low load situation in, in early March where we have you know, low cooling loads, um, and, and seasonal PV that's picked up on good solar days, we're actually having to curtail, and, and in our case in California, we're selling it at negative cost to Arizona and, and Nevada. That's right. Fourteen times last year, uh, California um, was buying PV, like, from my house at retail rates, and then they were paying Arizona to take that energy that they bought from me at retail rates um, but couldn't use their pay in Arizona to take it off of their hands. That sounds like a good business model to me. Yeah. <laughs> for David. For David. Yeah, for me, right. yes. You know, there is a lot of challenges there, right? If we really want to be sustainable with all of this, you know, everybody has to kind of make money in the process, right? We all have to have a business model around that, whether that's us as a building owner or the utility that is servicing these buildings. 
And so that's something to think about as we try to project what's going to go on to the future, right? We had 14 days last year where this happened in California. You know, the more renewables that come online, the more days that that's going to happen for. And one of the things we can do with buildings is be more responsive with the buildings. Um, so, okay. You wanna? Okay. So um, these slides actually came from Peter uh, in, in looking at two different buildings, right? The first one, you know, had some efficiency and then added a whole bunch of solar to it. Um, and so you've got the load, which, you know, gradually peaks up during the day and, and falls off. And then you add the solar in the middle of it. And so in the middle of the day, you're going to have this huge amount of export. But then very quickly, you're going to have to buy all that back because that building is going to hit peak in the afternoon. But if you really think about strategy-wise, you know, one way to think about it if you want some absolute rules is I don't want to use any energy between 4 and 8 p.m. Right? I want to really reduce that, and yet I want to be able to use more energy between 10 and 2 during the day. So keep in mind those two rules. You can really change the profile. Now, what's interesting about the building on the right in that profile, where we've reduced the peak load, we've filled in a little bit, we've shifted a little bit, is that from a utility point of view, that's about a 70% reduction in the amount of asset they need to meet that load. Right? And that's a big deal to them. And that, that's really kind of the idea between these. So us on the building scale, you know, when we're designing buildings, we have to be able to think about this capability in the building for grid harmonization and, and, and self-utilization. We're talking about more often about utilizing that PV um, before sending it to the grid system. And the difference between these two buildings, and one, one has the capability to utilize that PV and do demand response and load shift, and one cannot. And that's just in the design principles of what we have to deal with as designers for MEP systems, architectural systems, and, and specifics. And we'll get more in the, into that discussion later. So that net, oops, Sorry. I was just going to say, that, that net curve is shown here. So you can really see the difference between the two load profiles at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. so. Right. so the other thing is battery storage costs are dropping dramatically. And then there's the issue of people don't think about as much as how else can you store energy. So um, a lot of these are obvious, but why don't you explain the uh, clean dishes? The clean dishes, right. Well, storage takes on many forms, and a lot of it has to do with how people shift. If you talk to people that live off the grid, they will talk about how a lot of their lifestyle and things changes in order to inherently get storage out there. So that could mean as simple as clean dishes in the cupboard is a form of storage, right? Clean laundry is storage. You know, if you have a nice sunny day, a lot of people that are off the grid will do their vacuuming and their laundry and their dishes during the day when they have that resource. You know, that may not be practical on kind of a commercial building scale, but we do think about that in terms of the time sensitivities and how do you reduce that infrastructure. So you think about things like hot water storage, ice storage. You know, we talk about batteries, but there's still a you know, pretty high cost with that compared to just making ice, you know, again, between 10 and 2 every day, and then melting that ice later in the afternoon to reduce your demand. So last slide for this section. So this is the thing that actually... Paul said that really got me thinking and got me worried. Um, this is a graph that one of my staff did just of uh, a project that we're working on, a day in December, a day in June, and a day in March um, for a project that's designed to be a net zero energy building. Um, and the key point here is that the energy generation in December compared to the energy generation in June is like a four to one ratio. Um, the energy generation in December compared to the average of the net zero energy building is like two to one. So what Paul was saying that kind of really made me sit back and think is that if you have a net zero energy building, you're not coming close to the energy generation you need in the winter um, to be able to power that building. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, that's obvious, but... Um, I'm stupid, and it wasn't obvious to me <laughs> until I sat down and thought about it a little more. Well, and 
And, and David, what, what latitude is this, too? This so happens to be uh, California. So. Yeah, so that, that solar aperture really changes when you go into northern Idaho and into Canada. Right. And that, right. that thermal load, if you're switching to electrification for heat, is significant when you don't have the solar resource. So we've really got to uh, look at that regional resource and the seasonal resource as well. We'll talk about that a little bit later in, in what that uh, you know, seasonal piece looks like and, and some of that mismatch. But you know, this is a, a, you know, we can talk about the daily issue and, and dealing with that ramp rate. But you know, as we try to electrify more and more, and especially that heating load, that is going to, again, dominate the problem in most of the country in terms of energy load. Okay, so any questions? Comments? Arguments. Hopefully we're, we're stirring the pot here. Catherine. Okay, so Paul, I've seen that duck curve a couple of times, and your last actual date is 2013. Everything else on it is in projections. Do you have one that's more current that shows us actual in 14, 15, 16, 17? Because we're in 2018 right now. Yeah. I think Mark wants to answer that question. <laughs> we're in 2018. We're, we're going we're to say that that, that graph, other than uh, the fine duck overlay, came from Peter. Yeah, Cal California hit that 2017 projected, uh, uh, sorry, the 2020 projected in 2017. So we're already in the trouble ahead we created. We're ahead of the curve. Ahead of the, ahead of the we're, duck. We've got a bigger the belly. The belly is getting fatter faster. I'm, I'm recoining the giraffe yeah. curve. Um, so I had a question about, uh, you know, I, th I feel like a lot of the problem is probably that a lot of the PV is behind the meter. And does it affect the utility at all in the grid at all if you know a little bit more about the generation on the other side? Or does that having that knowledge not really change the, the issue? Dave, would you go back to that, the, the other slide um, with the concentrated solar? So, the, the, the oh, okay. Map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I, so, your, your assumption that, that there's more behind the meter PV versus utility scale PV I don't think is, is correct, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. We've, we've got a lot of uh, grid scale solar and concentrated solar. And what's interesting in this, and Paul pointed this out this morning, is the, the CSP there in orange, concentrated solar power, is actually has a thermal component to it that lasts well into that, that, the, the neck of the duck um, because of that thermal energy. Um, that the concentrated solar has. So that's an interesting application of, of and, and David asked the question earlier when we were talking is maybe we need more concentrated solar. Um, but I think to, to answer your question about the behind the meter solar, um, we need to start thinking on self-utilization as aspects, essentially utilizing that behind our meter first, but you know, we're, we're talking about rate structures that don't incentivize that. And, and David talked about that on his home. It's, we're going to get that more into that in, a, in the next yeah. one of the next sections. But yeah. The, the, the other part of this is that this is really utility grade PV. You know, for the most part, the utilities don't know, they know the PV is there, but they're just seeing that as an offset to their load in most cases. Uh, just to go with that utilization, you know, one of the things that if you've got PV on your buildings and thinking about it, Look at the percentage of PV that comes off of the roof of your building that you use instantly in your building versus selling back to the grid. I know in my zero energy house in Connecticut, I only use 17% of the energy immediately. The rest of it gets sold to the utility and I buy it back at my convenience. Right? And long term, we have got to get better and better incentivize that self-use of that that you're using, whether that's local storage or even just control strategies uh, to increase that. But right now, this is just utility solar, and all the stuff on the customer side isn't even showing up on these. If you go to any of the ISO mappings and they tell you the percent solar instantly, none of that includes behind the meter resources. Okay, we're going to move on to the, sorry. No, we're gonna, we've more. got to keep it moving. We could spend all day on any one of these topics. So. <laughs> yes. and, and, and we have a helper. I believe me, we have. Is, uh, <laughs> keeping us on track. So. Okay, so, so there's a question about talking about behind the meter, front of the meter. So this gets to some of those issues. So one of the things we were talking about is, uh, a, 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 as a group, as we were preparing for this, is um, what, what are the metrics and are they the right metrics, right? So... Ironically, 
USGBC announced that they're going to start doing a net zero energy uh, certification. Um, and so, uh, actually, in 2005, I was working on a design that, uh, I think in 2007, it was the first net zero energy commercial office in the United States. And, um, you know, we were thinking that's a really big thing. And then I... So this is like 2007. <laughs> I'm presenting this at David the AC, and I have a great discussion AC about AAA this, conference. Um, I'm thinking I did something really cool, and I talked to Shanti Pless and Paul Torsellini, and they're like, you know, that's not going to actually do much, and it may not, you know, actually have any effect. And I'm like, oh shit! <laughs> it's like I thought I did something great, right? Um, so. He did. I mean, to his credit, he did. Yeah. So he, he is, wasn't he, telling me that at the he's, time. He's being a Don't little discount. bit more um, hard on himself than he is, but it's a good point. So, so fast forward to now, and, and we've got these time of use rates and things like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about are these incentives like net zero energy? Everybody's trying to do that now. Is that like the wrong strategy and things like that? So, um, oops, sorry. So, you know, we're talking about this type of design that over over generates in the middle of the day and then um, takes that excess power and pushes it back to the grid. So this is the current PG&E rates uh, in Northern California. Um, so that little green inset is from 1982, I think it was. So PG&E was spending most of their money on energy, um, and that's changed pretty significantly. Um, and, and so a lot of it is on infrastructure and, and equipment and things like that. But right now, uh, even though we've got the duck curve going on and too much energy around noon a lot of times, the rates are set up to encourage me to, uh, from 12 to 6, I'm getting the highest rate. So that's when I want to spin my meter backwards. So putting in solar and not self-consuming it is a good idea because I spin my meter back faster, right? And so uh, PG&E's rates are about to change, and they're shifting that to late afternoon, say, you know, 4 to 9-ish or something like that. It's not 100% clear exactly what the hour is going to be. But the reason for that is because of this duck curve. So these are the current rates, and you can see, you know, if you're trying to match supply and demand, uh, it's not matching up very well, right? We got way too much supply, and um, so these are the new rates, and it does a better job at matching up to where the demand are. Yeah, David, the biggest challenge with this now is anybody doing large-scale solar on site and behind the meter solar, you're now disincentivized for producing that, and now you've got to think about applications to be able to either self-utilize before that rate structure in the three to eight or four to eight or four to nine, depending on what utility you're in, um, and start thinking about storage or thermal storage or building curtailment, uh, demand response, um, things like that, to be able to affect this future peak rate and demand. And this is where that concentrated solar power that um, Paul was talking about uh, where, where you melt salt and then can store it for a few hours after sundown and use it to generate electricity could potentially be very helpful. And so, interestingly enough, you know, no surprise, these are the rates, uh, wholesale rates in California. So um, you could see that you know, supply and demand are matching up almost perfectly. And, and notice how that starts to look like the belly of the duck to do that incentivize. So some of the things that we want to throw out there is these things are going to change and change pretty quickly as we go on. And as you're doing building designs and helping advise people about you know, a building that's going to be around for another 30 years, does it have the flexibility built in to deal with this rapidly changing utility grid, utility rate structure, and the need that we want to minimize our environmental impact? And so we can talk about being zero energy, which is still a very good metric to follow, and most people are nowhere near that if you just, you know, there's a set of folks in this group, but if you go outside of this room and wander up and down the streets, you notice a very different, you know, attitude about buildings and energy. So zero energy is very good and is working because it's a, it's a good absolute goal to go after. 
but we need to be thinking about what's next. Right? We need to be thinking how well will these buildings adapt to some of these future changes? How will we be able to use more renewable energy? Some of it is, is that if we design buildings to use lots of energy between 10 and 2 and not a lot of energy between 4 and 8, the cheapest way for utilities to meet that load is to add more renewables, which is something I think we all want. If we don't think about that, utilities have to respond and put resources on the grid at other times of the day, which may not be the best environmental solution. So, so questions? You've pointed out that there's a significant seasonal difference in the ability to generate electricity from photovoltaics. Could you address how that affects summer peaking utilities versus winter peaking utilities? So I'm going to try and some, I think some of that is going to shift, right? If you look historically, the line for summer peaking continues to move northward, right, as people add more and more air conditioning. Air conditioning has really driven a lot of that utility peak, okay? As we talk about electrification, and we've got some slides later, the, one of the questions is, is that that peak may not go down, but the winter peak has got to go up as we start electrifying more and more of those things because ultimately that heating load is still very large out there. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tend to see that that line may get pushed back down again as those winter peaks start getting higher. What the unknown is in the discussion is how electric vehicles could fill in those gaps, change that gap, or dramatically change this whole notion of seasonal peaking of the utilities. Um, and so I will leave it at that. So I think there's some unknowns there. The question is, is, are we prepared to deal with some of those unknowns? So I live in California. Um, so you would expect that my peak would be in the summer. But in actual fact, I have an all-electric home with TV on it. And in actual fact, uh, even in, you know, San Jose, the, um, my load peaks in the winter. I, I think it's very important to think about this regionally, too. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, which is a heating-dominated climate, um, in the winter you do still have a significant hydro resource, which is clean renewable. It's not the same for Iowa and the Plains. It can be in a heating-dominated climate. That utility structure and that provided the winter peak is very, very different regionally. So we need to really consider the regionality of this as well. The, the other part that, and it, and it really goes back to matching the supply and demand, is that in some of those areas have very different ratios between a wind resource and a solar resource as well as the hydro resource. And all of those things will come into this mix. Yeah, actually I was in a presentation yesterday and there was a guy from the UK talking about uh, their renewables, which is primarily wind. And he said they have a problem where they have too much power late, late at night um, in the winter. And so a lot of this is gonna be is very kind of um, regional specific. So, for example, maybe in, in the Midwest, um, you have primarily wind resource, and uh, you may actually need to put in more solar to help balance that out. Maybe in California, more, more wind to try to help balance out some of the solar. So I think, you know, right now there's primarily two kinds of, of um, renewable energy that we're looking at, I guess three if you want to include hydro. Uh, but um, it's, some of the answer, I think, is balancing those uh, different types of renewables and, and kind of when, when they're most available. Okay. I think we'll take one more in this uh, section. Okay, um, thank you. How do you put into the equation when we get home, we charge our electric vehicles? Because what we've heard from California utilities is that if everyone does that, they need their transformers to cool down at night, otherwise you go into brownout situations. And so they're going, please don't do it. How do we get like inductive looping in the parking lot so that we encourage people to charge during the day when this excess power? So have you looked at that? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, the next section, 
We, we will all. hit it. And if we don't hit it, you can stand you can up stand first back up next and time. Ask so the next section is on uh, that we wanted to talk about is electric vehicles. Because um, that's this new elephant in the room that has gone from like nothing to like big issue in a couple of years. Um, so uh, let's just talk about some of the data around electric vehicles. Um, so so um, I happen to live in, in the north, northern California, which is like ground zero for electric vehicles, I think. I, 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 I can't tell you how many Tesla Series 3 cars I suddenly see around that I, in the last like 30, 60 days. Um, so this is an interesting projection of, um, believe it or not, OPEC's projection for uh, electric vehicle adoption. So the, the blue bars were a forecast from 2015. The red bars, they revised their forecast in 2016, just one year later, because they realized that they're a little bit off. Um, <laughs> And I don't know what it is for 2017 or 18, but uh, the fact of the matter is uh, EV adoption is, is, is increasing rapidly. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of the manufacturers are talking about, about converting to either all electric vehicles or, or electric vehicle hybrids for 100% of their lines in a few years. So, so, you know, if you, if you look at where energy goes in the United States, you know, it's roughly thirds, right? A third goes into industry, a little less than a third goes into transportation, about 29%, right? And about 40%, a little more than a third goes into buildings. If you think about that building sector for a moment, and one of the strategies that we had on the first slide was shifting heating loads into electricity so that down the road we can shift to renewable resources to make that load. So a portion of, those, of that commercial and residential section is going to shift to electricity. And then if you say, we're going to take that entire transportation sector and shift it to electricity. Now we talk about that, yes, we're going to increase the efficiency of those pieces, but it's not hard to imagine, just as a thought experiment, that we could double the amount of electricity that's needed, right, as we make these shifts, you know, and especially looking at the projections on the last slide. And you have to say, well, where is that electricity going to come from? Where is that infrastructure going to go? Whose backyard are you going to run all those power lines in? You know, where are all those PV farms going to go? You know, just on the PV side, in Connecticut, which is where I'm familiar with, in 2017, no, 2016 is the, the stat number, Connecticut developed more land for PV farms than all other development. Right? And the question is, is, does, is that perfectly benign? And most of that was farmland. And we can have a different discussion around farmland and using farmland for, for sequestration of carbon. Right? But when you think about it, you know, huge amounts of infrastructure are needed to get us to this electrification. And so we got to kind of keep that in the back of our mind as we think about this. And the question is, how do we do that in a smart way? So when you look at some load shapes, um, you know, one is uh, the, the comment that was made a minute ago in the upper right, everybody goes home, they want to plug in their electric vehicle, so you get this huge peak late in the day. Well, that's just going to make the belly of the, cur of the duck that much steeper, right? And the utilities are struggling to figure out how to do that um, into those evening hours. The other attitude is people come in in the morning and they plug in their car and they want it charged as soon as they plug it in at the workplace. And so you end up with this huge morning load. Neither one of them go back to that cost graph that was up a couple slides ago Neither one of them are helpful for the utility infrastructure, are helpful for emissions, right, or cost, either the consumer cost or the utility cost. And so there is a real need to kind of figure that out. 
I know that we're doing a bunch of research around the electric vehicles on our campus in actually telling, telling a central system when you will need your car, when are you going to leave for the day, and it will figure out when the best time to charge it is based on the on-site renewable resources available. Right, so that also includes our own utilization rate of on-site PV. So we need to think about this because they are big numbers even in comparison to what's going on with the building. So, so um, this is starting to hit actually on projects that I'm working on. So uh, I'm doing an um, office building for a high-tech company. Uh, it's got a 500-car parking garage. Uh, we're putting in 195 charging stations. Uh, thinking about a 1,200 amp service for that, 480 volts. That doesn't have an impact on the electrical grid there, does it? It's like, not much, right? We, I, I checked one of our other offices was doing a, a, a residential tower in... Oh, sorry. One of our other offices was doing a residential tower in um, Seattle, um, and they had 800 future charging stations and had uh, space for future 2,000 amp switch gear. So, so one of the things that, that got me thinking about is, I mean, you're, you're basically taking, putting up a new building and increasing the load by a factor of one and a half to two, two times. Right, 200% increase. So it's back to what Paul is talking about, about the grid. Now suddenly you're pulling twice as much energy through the grid. So where is all that energy actually coming from? Is it coming locally? Is it coming from far away? You know, what's generating it? Um, Paul actually brought up this really interesting discussion of um, as you put more renewables in and potentially displace some of the baseload um, loads like nuclear, that could create a need to put in more um, short-term uh, resources to fill in the gaps when the renewables aren't there, which means more natural gas-fired um, generation, which, you know, I think is the wrong thing to do, but <laughs> is, is maybe <coughs> inevitable if, if you start putting in solar. So, it creates a lot of really interesting um, problems that I don't know that I know the answer. Maybe Paul does. He's a pretty smart guy. I'm not sure I have necessarily the answers other than thinking about use less between 4 and 8 p.m. and use more between 10 and 2, right? And that changes based on the utility, right, right? like Ted yeah. talked about before. But, you know, those will be local decisions that are made. Really, it's do buildings, are we controlling them, are we designing them to give us that flexibility? I, th I think if we're going to go the hyper-local, I live in uh, Sonoma County, and our, our current um, community choice aggregator had an incentive program to incentivize people to buy electric vehicles, but they also gave away the charging stations. And when you signed up for that free charging station, um, you allowed them to control the charger. So to be able to turn off that charger, and you see the opportunity on the last slide, let me go back one more. You know, if, if they've got control of the home chargers and be able to shift that off into the later period or shift that into the solar period, that's the opportunity to use that, that mobile battery storage. And if you can do the same with the commercial applications, to just move that shift an hour. Everybody comes in to the office, plugs in at 9 a.m. If you delay that charging into 11, 12, 1, and they're still going home at 5 o'clock, you've now utilized that solar resource instead of sending it you know, to Nevada for a negative two cents hit. Um, so there's the opportunity for the, the electrical vehicle storage. So, so one thing that um, we've been thinking about is how to, um, if, if you could go vehicle to grid, not just grid to vehicle, right? you could actually do quite a bit to smoothing out that curve. Um, there's some really s interesting control programs out there for EV charging nowadays that right now they're just kind of, I wouldn't call them dumb because they're smart programs, but they basically, instead of having that 
allowing that big hit at, as everybody plugs in and then and, and then kind of starting to tail off toward the end of the day they they make the that curve flat but they're not looking at what's grid need they're not looking at what even the building that it's connected through is peaking at so if the software was really smart it could look at what the building peak is and help uh, reduce the total demand rather than just the electric car part of the demand. So I think that's something that um, has a lot of promise in the future. The other thing that's a key issue is that if you look at EVs and commute patterns, I, you know, in 10 years maybe, seven years, I don't know, cars, are, almost all the EVs are going to have two, 200, 300 mile range, I'm thinking. Um, and the average commute's like, what, 20 miles or something like that to and from work. So in actual fact, in the future, a lot of the cars will have excess capacity. So there's a lot of interesting things that could happen if I'm parked in a parking garage, my car has 20 miles of charge that I just put into it, so it's fully charged, and then the utility says, I need some power. I'm more than happy to sell them half my charge and only have 100 miles of range if I only have a 20-mile commute home if the utility is going to pay me some big bucks for that power. So I think there's a lot of interesting things that could potentially happen if we can get um, cars to be able to put energy back onto the grid. There's, there's some technical issues with um, life of battery and things like that, but um, from what I'm hearing, they're not insurmountable. Well, and I think that's an important part of it is that a lot of the models that we think of on electric vehicles are pretty short <clears throat> amounts of battery storage and that you kind of bought a, an electric vehicle, it said it had an 80 mile range, you said well that's good, it gets me back and forth you know, 50 miles a day on my commute, but it does force you to charge it every day kind of when you get home or in the office. When you go to a much longer you know, kind of what I would call market viable in scale battery sizing, that gives you a lot more flexibility for most people. Uh, and I think that will help this uh, discussion also. I think one more thing to point out is there are a lot of regulatory hurdles right now with being able to do uh, vehicle to grid, and you'll probably see a little bit more of vehicle to home self utilization of that um, before you see vehicle to grid, uh, much less uh, regulatory hurdle when you're. Uh, doing that for yourself. Yeah, uh, evidently, your Japan's meter. already doing that. Uh, with well, Japan's Nissan. ahead of everybody. Yeah, I know. So, so you know, this point was just there's opportunities depending on time of day if we could kind of make cars work smartly with the grid. So, uh, questions? First, I'll tell everybody that I know the heating system is fully aware of the uh, duck curve, and I've asked them to try to Turn the heat down a bit, so just so you know. Push in the back. Does that answer your question? Uh, hi there. You've talked a lot about um, using cars to shift load um, to different parts of the day. You also talked a little bit about air conditioning as well. What about um, innovations in hot water, what we call domestic hot water generation? In Australia, we have an off-peak loading. Um, which is really to keep the coal-fired generators fired up. As that kind of shifts away, do you think there's going to be some innovation in uh, the way that we generate domestic hot water and how that could be shifted to? Yeah, I, I think that original slide that we had that had, you know, you know, anything that you can do to shift load and think about it as storage is important. And so hot water is a great one because inherently you can make the water a little bit hotter you can uh, put it into a larger tank. Uh, certainly the advent of heat pump hot water heaters is really interesting to me because not only is it using usually larger storage tanks, but typically by itself its demand is half of what the demand is for electric resistance. And so in some ways we're getting that by how that equipment is designed. Uh, but it really relies on a big storage tank to make that happen. Uh, so those are just more ways of getting storage. Yeah, we were sitting in a room uh, about three weeks ago with most of the major heat pump uh, hot water heater manufacturers uh, talking about um, electrification, uh, uh, 
conversion uh, gas hot water heaters to electric hot water heaters. And the utilities were in the room looking at that. On aggregate, you know, one, one of those is thermal storage is, is, is not a lot, a couple of kilowatt hours here and there. But if you aggregate 500 or 1,000 of those applications in a retrofit, you've got a huge opportunity for the utilities. So there's a huge interest in California of doing that right now. There's incentive programs from Sacramento U- Municipal Utility that will have control of the domestic hot water to be able to curtail through that four to eight period right now. So that's coming. It's already here. It's happening in California, and I'm hoping to spread that to the rest of the nation. So help me out. Um, so there have been people here at Greenville for the last few years uh, advocating for DC power infrastructure and thinking about the charging of the cars. I know my house, I've got the PV, goes through an inverter, becomes AC, goes back through my charger to be DC back to my car. Uh, how does the DC infrastructure fit into all this we're talking about? He's the electrical engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll take that one. Um, so there is some savings uh, from conversion DC to AC to DC. Uh, so we're certainly keeping an eye on that. Um, there's not a lot of uh, product out there, but I just recently heard of, of some pilot projects that are going on uh, using DC for different applications in buildings. So I think it's something that will come. There's a little bit of an issue. You can't just take Power Street out of a photovoltaic panel and stick it into a building because it fluctuates too much. Uh, but it's certainly, if you can do it, it's, uh, it's, it is uh, more efficient because you lose the conversion losses. I think the best application I've seen was in a, uh, a prototype packaged uh, rooftop unit. It had solar on it. We are looking at it at the Hawaii schools because they didn't, couldn't have the electrical connectivity for that. So it was a standalone HVAC unit. So when the sun was out, solar ramped up that HVAC system, provided cooling to the system. Um, I think if we can get more packaged opportunities like that that are pure DC, that would be pretty good when we've got solar resources that we can use for air conditioning loads in that instance. Um, I, I think some of that goes back to just, you know, we, we still have to really focus on efficiency, right? And that is one of the efficiency strategies out there. A technology like that, or whether you're putting more efficient lights or heat pump hot water heaters, those technologies are available to the building 24 hours a day, right? And they will help the grid or can help the grid 24 hours a day. When you look at a technology like solar, it's really only available five or six hours a day. And so efficiency has a much broader application um, in order to help the overall situation. And, and DC power is just one of those strategies that could do that. We've got one more so I have a public policy question, and I like your opinion. Um, I'm from California, so as you know, the California Energy Commission is requiring net zero residential and commercial buildings for all new buildings by 2020 and then 2030 respectively. And I project that if they follow that same line, eventually they'll require on-site storage. But at the same time, the California Public Utilities Commission has allowed San Diego Gas and Electric to shift their rates without requiring any storage from the utilities. Doesn't it make more sense to incentivize the utilities to have utility-scale storage and reduce the burden on the private owner in order to resolve the duck curve, which is a utility-side problem, not a demand-side problem? You get the California question. <laughs> you, you, you want me to address this? Uh, I, I'm knee deep in CEC and CPUC policy issues right now. Um, but yeah, Southern California Edison's already looking at regionalized uh, storage applications to solve some of their transmission distribution issues. So that huge upgrade cost of, of putting in power lines. So where they've got constraint uh, requirements, they're looking at storage applications regionally. Um, that's one way they're doing it. Um, as far as uh, rate structures, I'm going to stay out of that discussion right now. So um. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll take, put in my two cents on this also. So um, I think that, so the, the first thing is utilities are doing some storage. And um, I know pg and is doing some pilot projects with large-scale storage. So they're not ignoring it, they're not not doing anything, number one. Number two, 
I think the answer is going to be similar to the answer for renewables, and, and that's you do everything you can, right? And so if you look at kind of what actually happened, we started doing PV on buildings, but then the utilities started doing utility scale photovoltaics, and now what you have is a mixture of both those things happening, and we got there faster. And so I got to think that uh, you're going to see both things happening. And, and some of the people that are putting in batteries are not being forced to put them in. Um, the rate structures haven't even changed yet. I was meeting with the city of San Jose um, recently in the last couple of weeks, and one of their inspectors is telling me that uh, he's amazed how many uh, inspections he's doing for Tesla Powerwall. So people are putting them in. Uh, already. Uh, I know in Hawaii where if you have, um, if you start overproducing, you're required to just turn your PV off. Uh, a lot of people, they, that's a Tesla is Powerwall's biggest market because people don't want to throw the energy away. So I think um, you're, you'll see that happen, but um, some of the answer is going to be it needs to happen at utility scale too. So I think that, that's a good lead into kind of the fourth topic on matching supply and demand. Um, and, you know, if you look at the built environment, the reason the utility grid largely looks the way it does is because of how we long-term develop buildings, and those buildings needed energy at different times of the day. Um, I think it also is a matter of what can each of us influence, right, in our personal lives, in our professional lives, out there, right? Not all of us can, can just broad brush say, we are the king and this is the new policy. Um, but I think we need to get ready with things. A lot of us are in the design world making design decisions. And so looking at, you know, passive design concepts, how do you, you know, shift loads with that, uh, you know, putting batteries on your side of the grid. So there are several things, you know, you know, that are, are very important to this whole discussion in terms of orientation, shading, roof space, putting thermal mass in the building, um, you know, reducing solar gains wherever possible when you've got a cooling load issue, being able to naturally ventilate. We had an interesting discussion before about what was passive. And, you know, natural ventilation sounds very passive, but we also talk about mechanical actuators on windows to help with that. So, you know, again, there's some balance between that. Uh, but the idea is, is reducing that load all the time because these strategies work all the time. There's a new one that's out there about the orientation of the PV system um, and whether we should start talking about more PVs, especially facing west, to, to have that load later in the day and not have it as much in the morning. Again, if somebody's going to incentivize you and pay you for that, that may make a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, looking at just active ways of doing it in terms of HVAC controls, better lighting controls, we've touched on different types of thermal storage. Um, you know, and you talk about whose side of the meter. Is it better for a utility to put in a large-scale battery system, which is really the only commodity they can buy and sell, versus taking that commodity and making ice off-site or on your building outside of the utility, using maybe your own PV resource so that you can melt ice later in the day uh, to provide your cooling load, right? It's not a, we just need a lot of batteries. What we really need is a lot of storage and the ability to shift that coupled with energy efficiency. Um, there's some other ones that are fascinating around ground source heat pumps and even looking at those as a seasonal storage technique. And we've touched on the EV charging controls. So um, I'm working on this interesting project that uh, uh, it's an outdoor swimming pool in California, and believe it or not, it actually gets cool in California once in a while. And so it's a, um, like a high-level training competition pool, and it's used all year round, and, you know, in the winter it does get down into the 30s. Um, and so... Um, we're trying to do this as a net zero energy, um, not gas heated swimming pool. And so 
one of the strategies we looked at to keep that pool hot all winter long is to put a solar thermal array up on the roof of the stands and create hot water. And of course, the problem with solar thermal in California is you get way too much hot water in the summer when you don't need it. And for a, a competition pool, they keep them cooler than a normal pool anyway. And then in the winter, when you do need it, you're getting hardly anything. And so what our mechanical engineer uh, decided to do is pipe that solar thermal heat into the ground and just heat the ground up all summer long. Uh, and then in the winter, run a, a ground source heat pump to pull the heat back out of the ground and heat the swimming pool. And as wasteful as that seems, solar thermal is actually uh, very low energy use because you're just running a small pump all day long. Um, so you're able to, to um, heat that ground up at very little energy cost. Um, and, then, and then, you know, as long as you don't have something like, like water moving underground or a high water table or things like that, you could actually store that heat and use it later in the season, right? And that's what we were talking about earlier is the most difficult problem to solve is that seasonal problem. So that's one potential solution. So we have a couple minutes to uh, wrap this up here. Um, just, just back to the battery storage and, and vehicles. Um, you know, being able to take that load that we have as excess um, and just shift it um, around during the day is important. And electric vehicles have that potential, as well as other building elements having that potential. And again, I think, you know, kind of the easy thing to focus on is what can we do to reduce loads late in the day, and what can we do to use more loads when there's good PV available. And so we challenge all of you to kind of think around um, that piece as, as we go on. Uh, hopefully this dialogue has been, you know, a, a useful discussion. Um, and start of it, I know there are lots of questions and things out there um, about that. But hopefully it gave you some things to think about. I know we had a lot of fun just talking <laughs> ahead of time and going back and forth on, you know, what are some of these issues? What do we need to be thinking about in the future, right, of buildings? Because the buildings we're building today, the decisions we're making today on buildings are going to be here for a long time. And we need to be ready to adapt for this huge influx of renewable energy because it is cheap and it is coming. Uh, and that's a good thing. So, you have a closing comment? No, I'll leave it at that. You did a good, good okay. job. Leave it at that. Okay, any last questions? We have about two minutes. Quick, easy. Who pays for the grid in this model? Society. Society, right. We, we had a big discussion about our natural gas uh, challenge in California, about if we want to get off natural gas, who pays for decommissioning the natural gas supply system? Do we own that as a society? Do we own the infrastructure that we need to upgrade in the utility, and do we pay in that as rate payers to give the capability of a smart grid? You know, that grid's been around for 100 years now. It takes a lot to build that infrastructure and maintain it. Do we as a society and us using the grid as a battery have a responsibility for upgrading that? I say absolutely, yes, we do. Hey, Ted, on top of that, could you just speak to the current Public Service Commission investor and utility relationship that was probably established during the 50s? Mm -hmm. And is that being adapted to allow the utilities to be more flexible and still, you know, live underneath a service commission because they're monopolies? The fact that we're having a discussion about building decarbonization at all in our state is absolutely amazing, and that didn't happen six months ago. Um, the fact that they're talking about modifying a rate structure under a three-year time period um, into like a one-year or six-month cycle is amazing, and we need rate structures to change to be able to utilize um, some of these technologies and incentivize that. Um, I've sat with Commissioner McAllister of the California Energy Commission and uh, Commissioner Picker, who's on the California Public Utilities Commission, in the same room having a really great conversation about these things that we're talking about, building decarbonization, grid harmonization. How do we get that dumb, done in the time scale that we need to have it happen, which is now, 
10-year plan, we need to have this done. So how do we get all of these utility commissions, the IOUs, the public to buy in on this? And, and then the, the manufacturers and the and technology the to come into market to play. There's a huge application that we're trying to get done, um, one through the Building Decarbonization Coalition, but um, things like New Buildings Institute, New U.S. Green Building Council, just getting all these players into the same room to have this discussion of, look, guys, we're out of time. We need to get this done. We need to have a 10-year plan, and we need to have this done, and I need to be out of a job in 10 years because building decarbonization is not a topic anymore. Um, that's my take on it. So and one really, really interesting point that um, was brought up by the utilities is that, you know, that change that I showed you, shifting the peak from, you know, 12 to 6 to, you know, whatever it's going to be, 4 to 9, say, um, that's a that's a radical change in the, in the rates um, that has major impacts on the people that are investing in renewables and things like that, utility-scale renewables, right? The utility companies already stressing out about stranded assets for, you know, we put in all this natural gas pipeline, and now you're telling me we're going to go with all electric buildings, so that investment's just going to go, boom, right? And that's a problem. So you can't with things like this, you can't just change the rates every six months or you're going to put a bunch of people out of business. And so, you know, this really is, it, it's, it's a problem. I totally agree that it's a problem that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed as quickly as possible, but also it needs to be addressed really thoughtfully because there's a lot of unintended consequences and things that can happen um, that that could cause really bad results either for society, for the, um, the utilities, um, for the energy providers. So um, we'll leave you with that. We, we don't know that we have all the answers. We have some very in interesting thoughts, though, about it, and we'd love to continue this discussion um, after we're done. So thank you very much. Thank you.